Last week we talked about, in Hebrews chapter 5, about the fact that as a believer, as a Christian, there must be growth in your life. And uh, that was just to remind us of the fact that if there is no desire to grow and there is no growth in your life, then there's a spiritual disconnect and it's a fatal one. Uh, the spiritual disconnect is in a place and a fact that uh, you are not rightly related with Christ because it's normal and it's natural for us as believers to now become hungry and want to eat and to grow in the area of spiritual things. And so uh, we talked about that last week in Hebrews chapter chapter 5 and uh, beginning of Hebrews 6. And so today uh, we're going to go back where we started a few weeks ago in John chapter uh, 3. Not yet. We're going to go there in just a minute. Now? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a lot of clicks on this thing and so forgive me. All right. Um, they do a great job. Um, but we're going to start in Genesis chapter 3. I just want to read that scripture for you so that we can begin to understand a little bit more about why we're in the predicament that we're in as human beings and then uh, what, what needs to take place in our life. And we'll go to John 3 to look at that. Um, before we begin, let's have a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get started on our study today. God, we are grateful and thankful for your many blessings. We were talking in Sunday school this morning just about what we have in Christ. And um, it's just a gift from you. Everything from our salvation, our faith, our understanding, all of these things are what you have deemed and done in us. It says that no man can come to Christ until we are drawn by the Father. And whomever the Father draws, Jesus will accept and we'll never, ever, ever cast them out. It's eternal life. It's eternal security. And God, all of that work is you. All of that. When I was running from you, and when I wanted nothing to do with you, you stood by and you waited, and then you drew me. You drew me. And God, that drawing has not stopped. You continue to draw me into this relationship deeper and deeper and deeper. Your desire is to be more and more intimate with us. Uh, God, I pray that that would become so apparent in every believer here. And Lord, as we continue this study that, Lord, I'm sure that will take us some time. It's a study. We'll look at an awful lot of scripture. And so God, every one of these verses were written by you. Every one of them. And Lord, you have a purpose in everything that you wrote. I pray that you will open our understanding, that you'll make this scripture very plain. Your word teaches us that your word never returns void. It will always do what you have designed it to do. In every person who hears it every single time, it will harden some, and some it will draw, some it will soften. But God, the work of the word, not my work, not what I do, it's what you do through us. It's what you do through me. God, it is the teaching that, that you, your word does when we open it. And so today, God, as we look at numerous scriptures, we just ask you to speak to us. You've promised to do that. And God, I come to you claiming that promise today. Speak, Lord. We're ready to hear. And we want you to touch our hearts. And we want you to break our hearts if necessary. And we want you to draw us into that intimate relationship with you so that we can begin to grow as you've caused us and called us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 3, a very familiar story in the scriptures. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Genesis 3, verse 1. It says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The Lord God made everything. Didn't he? Lord God made everything. This morning in Sunday school we were talking about the very fact the last message that is preached in scripture the last message this is a, the last message is preached in scripture but it's the last message that will ever be preached. It is the last message that God sends an angel out in Revelation chapter 14. God sends an angel out with the last message of the gospel from heaven. 
And it says this angel goes to every nation, every country, every tribe, every human being, and presents this message. And the message that this angel sends out, or that God sends out, that the angel carries, the messenger, is just simply this. God who created everything. Isn't it amazing how creation is so under attack? God starts the word with it. God ends the word with it. And God brings it up over and over and over and over. You know what? I wouldn't have a bit of trouble coming to school to bail any of you kids out. All right? If when they begin to tell you that you came from an ape, if you stood up and said, I'm so sorry for you, but actually I was created. I'm all right with that, okay? Because that's exactly what the Word teaches. That is the truth. That is the honest truth from the Scriptures. God's proud of His creation, and we're all a part of that creation. Uh, every single one of us. And so, everything that we see, everything that we don't see was created by God. That separates Him from all of us. He is the Creator. We are the created. And even in this situation, the serpent, the snake... Satan himself was a creation of God. It says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Oh, did God really say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? No, God didn't say that, did he? It's easy to see how it's not, I mean, we get caught up in it all the time, but the Satan, will, Satan will begin to take words and he'll begin to plant them in our heart and begin to plant them in our mind and they'll begin to grow into doubt and they can grow into a lot of things. And so he says, did God tell you that you couldn't eat of all the trees of the garden? But if the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's what the woman said. The woman's response said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of that one tree that's in the midst of the garden, out in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now let me back up and tell you one thing. God never said you couldn't touch it. Never did he say that. God said, don't eat of it. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. But let me tell you how humanity works. And I believe Adam, who was in charge of this situation, Adam was to advise. If you go back in the scripture, you'll find when God told, put out the message that you are not allowed to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden that they're describing. He told Adam, even Eve wasn't created. He told Adam, you may not eat of that tree, knowing how a woman works. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Huh? Adam said, don't eat off of it. Don't look at it. Don't go near it. Don't go within a hundred feet of that tree. That tree will kill us deader than a hammer. <laughs> That's the honest goodness truth right there. You, you, you Go back and search scriptures. That's exactly right. He was, God had been so emphatic about eating from the tree. Don't eat from that tree. Well, you don't eat from that tree if you don't go near it, you don't touch it, you don't look at it, you don't do anything else. And so I believe the word from Adam was emphatic. Stay away from that tree. The word of God was given to Eve through a messenger just like today. All I do in here is read to you the Bible and what it says. That's what, how we learn, right? So, when we open this book, it's the truth. It comes from God. And the instruction was very clear in that day. Eve knew what she should do and what she shouldn't do. And the serpent said to the woman, You won't die. You will not surely die. You know, God's got to love. Right? God wouldn't send anybody to hell because he's God of love. How could a God who loves people send anybody to hell? You ever heard that? Have you ever heard we're all God's children? That's the same lie. I mean, that's what the scriptures teach us, and that's what we're going to talk about today. It's not true. We're not all born God's children, and God's very clear about that. God's very plain about that. 
Something must happen in your life and in my life for us to become God's children because it started right here, but it's carried on to today. The snake, the serpent, Satan said to the woman, you shall not surely die. And God does know. This is what God knows, Eve. That in the day that you eat thereof, of that particular fruit, your eyes will be open. And you will be as God's. And you will know good and evil. Listen to that. God knows that the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's. And you know between good and evil. You want to know something? That's exactly what happened. Because every one of us has made a God out of ourself. It says that Eve looked... Listen to what he said, and she looked at the fruit, and she thought to herself, I'd like to be in control. I want to make my own decisions. I want to call my own shots. And I'll be just like God. I'll have the wisdom of God to be able to do that. And every human being since that day has been born with that very same heart. We all think we're as smart as God. We start out that way. We think that we can, do, we can determine how and when we will become Christians. We think and we believe because of our God status that we've given to ourselves that even though we hear the message and we hear the message and we hear the message, then I get to decide when and how I will begin to live for Christ. I don't know if this is how you do it, but this is how I did it. One of the ways and one of the things I did when I was running was simply, I never said no to God. I'd hear the message preached all my life growing up, every time. And I was in church five times a week, four or five times a week, every single week. And I would hear the message and I would hear the message. And my decision was made that someday I'm going to make a decision to walk with God, just not today. I'll determine when it is that I'm going to begin to walk with God. Because I'm God of my life, and I like being God of my life, and I like to be in control of my life. Now, I never said that. But that's literally how I lived. And the thing that I didn't understand, even though I'd heard it, I just didn't grasp it, I didn't understand it, was what actually happens is every time you hear the word and you say no, you get a little bit harder. Your heart begins to be a little bit harder and a little harder and a little harder until we become so hardened. We can't hear anything. We can't respond to anything. And so it works in our life the exact opposite. Even though we know we've got it figured out, the way that it works is to harden us. The Word always does what God determines to do. It will harden us to the point that we can't do anything. Being our own God is not a good deal. And yet it's something that we strive for and that we do over and over. We have our own plan for eternal life. And you and I must come to an understanding, and we've talked a lot about this the last few weeks, I know that, but I just want you to understand. Dead people can never make a decision. This is so simple. God lays this out so clearly, so plainly, in a language that we can understand. He says that you and I are born spiritually dead. Eve, we know, took the fruit and she ate it. She told us why she did it. She did it. She then turned and handed it to Adam. Adam had a decision to make. He was either going to decide to be to follow God or to follow Eve. And so he made a decision that he loved the creature more than the creator. And so he took the fruit and ate it and they both died. They clearly made that decision. You and I have made similar decisions over and over and over and over in our life. To choose between God or someone else. To choose between God and ourself. We do the very same thing. And what happened that day in the garden is that my soul and your soul died just like that. Adam lived to be 900 years old, but his soul died immediately. 
his ability to communicate with God died immediately. And I was born spiritually dead. That's what the scripture teaches. I had no ability to grasp God, to reach out for God. I had no ability. I, I don't know how much time you've ever spent around dead people, but they never respond. Have you ever noticed that, Danny? Every time I do a funeral and I stand there and I talk, I've never had anybody ever say anything back to me. Have you? No. Not, a, not one single time. Dead people don't respond. And I don't understand why. Do you? Of course you do. Of course I do. They can't. It's impossible. And so when God says as a person, a human being, I was born spiritually dead, that's exactly what it means. And it says something must happen that you have no control over and I have no control over. It's God that does all of it. And that's what we're going to learn. That's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to study. And I told you last week, and I'll tell you again, and I'll tell you every week, I suppose, until we uh, finish this. Every time you miss a lesson, every time you don't respond to the lesson, you will further fall a little further behind. If you don't respond immediately to what God wants you to do, then you may res not respond ever. Now, I, that's not a threat. I'm just telling you how it works. And I've told you before. I've talked to people at times and talked to people and talked to people about the Lord. I've stood and had conversations with them. Uh, then I've gone and to where they're in the hospital and I've had them tell me in the hospital after I've sat in their house or we visited together I've gone to the hospital when they've begun to be sick and I've talked to them about the Lord and answered any questions that they have and I've gone back again at the hospital and talked to them about, how, about the Lord and literally said to them listen I know you've heard a lot about God are, are you ready to, to make a decision no not yet not yet not yet and I've literally literally not because I thought it would do any good, but it was a comfort to the family. I have literally gone to those same people in a coma after visit after visit after visit and leaned down and whispered in their ear, friend, if you can hear me, this could be it. And then I've watched them pass out. Into, I've had them tell me no to their last breath and then die. You see, you get to a point you can't respond. And so if you hear it today, don't put it off. If you hear it next week, don't put it off. Deal with what God tells you. So in John chapter 3, look there with me just for a minute. John 3. We've already talked about the first three verses of this. We talked about Nicodemus, who he was. He was a ruler, it says, in Israel. He was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a, a Pharisee, a Sadducee. He was a leader. He was a teacher. Jesus said this of him in verse 10. He said, listen, you know, you are the master. In other words, it not just, you're not just a teacher. You are the teacher. Uh, it, says that, it says there in verse 10, that Jesus said to him, you are teaching people. You have knowledge. You are one of the elite teachers in Israel, and you don't get this? You don't understand this? Because everything that we're going to talk about today that Nicodemus should have known and understood was taught 700 years at least before. The thing that you and I need to begin to understand is what God wrote in Genesis chapter 3 about becoming spiritually dead and about being raised from the dead is all talked about in Genesis chapter 3. This Bible has not changed from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. It is one long story, but it's the very same thing. We break it up into an Old Testament, into New Testament. It's all one testament. And I know that there are the way God handles things a bit differently between the Old Testament and New Testament. But everything that we read, when we read in the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament wrote things down. And they quoted scripture after scripture after scripture in the New Testament. Where did that scripture come from? The Old Testament. And so they're quoting the Old Testament about how people can become believers and Christians. This book is relevant on every single page. And the message never changes. And so, when Christ said to Nicodemus in chapter 1, 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except that God be with him. Now, Nicodemus comes with a question, and he begins to beat around the bush. You ever do that? You ever come and you just beat around the bush? Jesus Christ knows your heart. Jesus Christ didn't respond to any of his questions or any of his comments. Jesus Christ didn't turn to him and say, thanks for the compliment. Hey, I appreciate that very much. Jesus Christ went right to the heart of the matter. Jesus Christ, knowing his heart, because Jesus Christ is God, looked at him, it says, and he said this, Verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen, is what that means. Verily, verily, I say, Say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Questions? Pretty simple. Unless you're born again, you see, I was born the first time 68 years ago, soon be 69. Born first time. I have evidence of my birth. Do you have evidence of your birth? Right? Every one of us has evidence of our birth. I walked around for many years without God, and now I've walked around many years with God. But in all those years, there was, it was evident that I was born. I had nothing to do with my birth. How about you? Were you ever at a point in place that you decided I think I'm going to be born. Who do I want to be my parents? Let's see. Is that what you did? You had nothing to do with your birth, did you? You just showed up one day. And you were a mess. And the Bible says that even though you squalled and you yelled and you messed your pants and you messed up the room and you all that you do, did back then, even though there was evidence and you were making a mess in your life and doing things, you didn't plan it. You didn't do any of that. God just made sure you were here. You were born the first time, right? We were born the first time. And so Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, one birth isn't good enough. One birth's not good enough. You must be born two times. How many people do you think have to be born two times? Every time. How many people do you think are born two times? Very few. Very few. You must be born again. Nicodemus, picking up on that theme that Jesus just laid out, said to him, Now remember, Nicodemus is brilliant. Nicodemus says to Jesus, how is that possible? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now Nicodemus knew that that wasn't what had to happen. He was well aware of the fact that that's never happened before. No one has ever gotten back inside of his mother and gotten delivered the second time. But following what had been said by Jesus, he gets onto that theme and he said, all right, all right, explain it to me. We know that can't be done. Explain to me. Wait a minute, what's he talking about? He's wanting to know exactly what Jesus wanted to, him to know, didn't he? He came to Jesus and asked him all kinds of ways and came about all different kinds of things. And Jesus said, look, this is, this is something that you're going to have to grasp and you have to get a hold of. And Nicodemus did, as a matter of fact. But Nicodemus comes to him and said, he said, how do, you do, how do you possibly do that? And Jesus in response to him, he says this. Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water. Now we would define that as we talk about that. Some, what you've heard talked about at least, is water is the first birth. Unless a man be born once by the first birth by water, and then he be born of the Spirit, that's the second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I would agree to that, and I also believe it means something else. 
There has to be a first birth or you wouldn't need a second birth. Is that right? But I don't necessarily think that Jesus is addressing that. When he says you must be born of water, if Nicodemus is a teacher of the scriptures, Nicodemus would have known or should have known at least what he was talking about. Because the scriptures had been very clear about what water birth was. What God was talking about. And that's what we're going to learn about today. What is he really talking about? Is he talking about the first birth? The water birth? You all were born in water. Did you ever, anybody ever been around a woman that's about to have a baby and they say something like, my water broke? Huh? You ever heard that? And when the water breaks, it's time for the baby to come. And so that's what they point to. They're talking about this water birth. But let me show you something else that the scripture teaches. Uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Hold your place because we'll come back. But Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. Let me say this about Ezekiel 36. This is probably one of my favorite. It's not, yeah, they're all pretty favorite, but this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, probably. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 20. I'm going to go back to 19 just so you understand what he's talking about. But in chapter 26, 36, verse 19, it says, I scattered, God says, I scattered the, the, the Israelites, his people, among the heathen. They were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. He says that my people, God's people, Christians, what we would consider today to be Christians, when my people were dispersed. They entered unto the heathen everywhere they went. Now tomorrow morning, this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow morning, every time I walk out of this door, I go somewhere, don't you? I haven't seen any of you in the parking lot most of the time. You all leave and you go somewhere, correct? And so what happens, every place you go, you are dispersed among the heathen. Do you know that? When I go to the restaurant today, the difference between a heathen and an unheathen is a heathen is someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, and a heathen is, or an unheathen is one who does know Jesus Christ. A saved person, a born again person. So everywhere I go and everything that I do, all day long, every day, I am dispersed among the heathen. Okay? And so are you. We go out, God sends us out among those people. And it says, and when they entered into the, when they entered, when they entered, these people, when they went out, and you and I go out today, everywhere they go, they profane my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. I hope that's not true of you. That when you go out among the heathen, you look so much like the heathen that the heathen literally look at you and say, what? You mean that guy's a Christian? He's no better than I am. I'm as good a Christian as he is and I'm not a Christian. And so what happens is when we go out and we do not carry God's name properly to those who are lost... We have an even worse impact. It's better for you not to claim to be a Christian than to claim to be a Christian and be a poor one. Now, I'm not going to kid you. And you all know me. I can fail, and I will fail almost on a daily basis in my walk with Christ. I get angry. I get upset. I say things that I shouldn't. I respond improperly. I have lustful thoughts. I do things that God is not pleased with. We all do, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living like a heathen, doing the things that the heathens do, and then claiming to be a believer in Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, I have a cure for that. He said, I had pity on my holy name. I had a pity on my name which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen everywhere they went. Therefore... Say unto the house of Israel, Go tell these people profaning my names. Thus saith the Lord God, I am going to fix this. I do not this for your sakes. I'm not fixing this for your sake. 
I'm doing it for my holy namesake, which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went. I will sanctify my great name. I will set my name apart. I will make my name holy even amidst unholy people. It has been profaned among the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them. And when I am done, the heathen will know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I will be sanctified, set apart in you before their eyes. Set apart, sanctified in you. I go out and I'm a bad testimony. And I'm a poor testimony a few years ago. I, I would tell people, yeah, I grew up in church. I'm a Christian. I've told you about a lot of times. I'm not forceful around people, but you listen to what people say and, and you, you see a door wide open that they're wanting to ask a question. And so it's like Nicodemus. You know, you say, okay, well, here, let me help you out. So you sit down on an airplane or you're sitting down in a restaurant or whatever and you look across at somebody and, and uh, uh, they'll say, you bow your head to pray for your meal. You ever do that in a restaurant? Bow your head to pray. And uh, people will come up and say, uh, you know, I noticed, were you, were you praying? <laughs> Is that what you were doing right there? Yeah, and actually I was just uh, tying my shoes, but... Um, <laughs> You know, you don't know what to say. You, know, you don't want to be uncomfortable around them, right? But no, you bow your head to pray and they come up and they say, you know, were you, were you praying? And you say, yeah. And then what do you do? You, you say, yeah, see ya. Why would they ask that question? And so you say, yeah, I was. Do you pray for your food? Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. I've told you about sitting next to people on planes and a guy, you take your, ball, your Bible out of, the, out of your briefcase or whatever it is. I've always, I told you, I, uh, I always carry my Bible in briefcase when I'm traveling because God will never knock a plane out of the sky if you're reading your Bible while you're flying. <laughs> okay? So I reach down and get my Bible out and I say, look, see, God, I'm right here. And so, but anyway, you get your Bible out and you put it in the pocket or you put it up on your lap and you start reading the scriptures because that's a good time to study. It really is. Not really. Uh, you pull it out and the person usually sitting next to you say, is that a Bible? You say, yeah, it is. Do you, do you, do you study the Bible a lot? Yeah. Um, and so I'm sitting next to a guy on a plane who was just scary looking. And he said to me this. He said, uh, wow, you, you got a Bible there. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, do you go to church? I said, I do. He said, are, are, you, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, I am too. And I said, awesome, dude, that's awesome. That's great. And I said, tell me about it. And it went real quiet. I said, tell, tell me about it. Tell me, tell me about your walk with the Lord. How's that? How you, tell me about that. Uh, you know, and let me let me share with you a couple things about mine, where I am right now. But then you can tell me about yours. You know, and so you share it, and then he'll say. And this guy looked at me and he said, "Yeah, I, I'm a Christian." And I said, "What? Well, uh, tell me about it." Well, my grandma used to take me to church. Now here's a guy that's 45 years old, and I said, "Cool. Tell me about your relationship with Christ." Well, my grandma would, used to always go to church. Well, do you go to church now? No. Well, what made your grandma a Christian? Well, she always used to go to church. But you don't go to church. Well, no, I don't. Well, if your grandma was a Christian because she went to church, how are you a Christian if you don't go to church? Now, number one, going to church don't make you a Christian. You know, anymore, when you all go home today and you stand in your garage, you won't become a car. <laughs> Going in church won't make you a Christian. Standing in your garage won't make you a car. It won't. If you sit in your bathroom long enough, you won't become a bathtub. It just doesn't work that way. All right? It doesn't work that way. God has to work in your heart. And in this situation, but you sit on the plane or wherever you go, God gives you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to to pry open the door a little bit in someone's life. When you get off of that airplane, you will probably not have had any noticeable effect on the life of the person that you've sat next to, but you've planted a seed. 
You have watered a seed that someone else has planted. As a believer, as a Christian, that's what Christians do. Heathens don't. And so when God sends me out into the world, He expects me to do Jesus' things, doesn't He? And the Bible teaches us that everywhere Jesus went, He taught people about Jesus Christ. And so my responsibility as a Christian is to be just like Christ. And everywhere I go to look for an opportunity to glorify the Father, to glorify the Son who have done so much for me. Or I can choose to continue to live like a heathen lives. And be an embarrassment to God. That's what he said. He said, my people have become an embarrassment. Now I've got to go back and fix things because they've become such an embarrassment. I sent them out to proclaim how great I am. And they didn't do it. Instead of proclaiming how great I am, they infiltrated the heathen and became heathens. Just like them. Their life is no different. We look just like them. You and I get up in the morning and hope that nobody notices we're Christians. We want to be in God's secret service, right? We're hoping that we can infiltrate those people, but hope that we never get called upon to tell anybody about Christ. And so he says to them, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you profaned in the midst of them. And then when I am done, the heathen will know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I will be sanctified in you. When God changed me, he is now using me to change people's lives, which is exactly what he wants to do with every one of us is to use us to go out and affect the lives of other people everywhere we go. He said, I will take you from among the heathen. I will reach in. God says, I will reach in and I will pull you out of the heathen. I will gather you out of all the countries and I will bring you into your own land. And when I come and I collect you from among the heathen, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. When I clean you, when I cleanse you, when I wash you, you will be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. So when God came and He purged me of my sin... He didn't cleanse me of a few sins. He didn't cleanse me of what I had done to that day, and I'm on my own from now on. The Bible teaches us, not just here, but throughout the Scriptures, that when He came and He sprinkled His water upon me, when He, he scrubbed me and He washed me spiritually, I am permanently clean, is what He's telling me. I didn't do it. I didn't even want it done. In the beginning, he came where I was among the heathen and he pulled me out of there. And he scrubbed me. He used his water to cleanse me, it says. And then when he cleansed me, it said, he gave me a brand new heart. He gave me a brand new heart. And I'll put a new spirit inside of you. I'll take away that old stony, hard heart that you've had. And I'll give you a new heart. Buddy, if that didn't happen to me. That happened to you? Man, I was as evil as they came. Danny Van Dyke used to say that about me. He said, you know, you know, you know every time I see you and I listen to you preach, I think to myself, man, that dude's a miracle. He said to me, he was trying to be really nice. You know, Danny was really trying to be nice. And Danny can be nice every now and then. And so Danny was really trying to be nice. He looked at me and he said, you know what? You were, um, you were, um, man, you were wicked. You were evil. And God reached inside of me and took that evil heart out. And gave me a brand new heart. God doesn't mess around just fixing you up. 
God washes you and gives you a new heart. God puts His Spirit inside of you. God gives you a desire to follow Him. God gives you a new mind. You cannot continue to live heathenistic ways and have peace in your heart. When I would go back to my heathen friends and I would try and integrate in with my heathen friends, every time they used God's name in vain, every time they swore and they cursed and they did things, it would just tear me up. I didn't even know why it was bothering me. Tuesday it didn't bother me. It's Friday and it's killing me. What happened? He washed me. He cleansed me and He gave me a new heart. That's what happens. When people say to me, I do not have to change my lifestyle just because I'm a Christian, my response is, you're ex exactly right. But if you have become a Christian, you can't help but your lifestyle change. You cannot live... You know what? If you were born a chicken, it's hard to live in the pig pen. Right? And if you're a pig, it's hard to, to be completely changed and turned into a hawk and continue to live with the pigs when God has created you now to fly. And I watch it over and over and over and have people tell me that and I'm expected to be kind and say, oh, I understand. I don't understand. I don't get it. We have come so far away from the holiness of God in what we call the church that it just blows me away. How we can call sin good. I, I, I don't get it. How we can have compromised so much when God put a new heart within you. And that's what he's saying. Nicodemus, who was a teacher of the law, he knew the truth. He understood the scriptures. And God said to him, Jesus Christ said to him, you know what, you must be washed. And you must have a new heart. That's what he told him. And Nicodemus looked at him like he was, he was in from outer space. And God says, have you not read the scriptures? That's what he asked him. In Isaiah, Isaiah wrote, this is what will happen. This is what will take a place. In Ezekiel, that's what Ezekiel wrote. God repeated it over and over and over what's going to take place in your life when you become a believer. This is the new birth. This is why you must be born again because your old you will never get into heaven. It takes a new person, a new heart, a new being. It goes on to say this. I'll put my spirit within you and I'll cause you. When my spirit moves inside of you, listen to this. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. The Bible teaches me this, the minute I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. When you did, when you did, when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the spirit of God moved inside me. Did he do that for you? If you're a believer, God's spirit moved inside. I used to not have God's Spirit. God's Spirit moved inside of me. Now you tell me how God's Spirit can live inside of me or you and me continue to live the way that I lived. It's an impossibility. He said, I will give you a new heart. I'm going to put my Spirit within you. He will move inside of you. He then says this, a new spirit will I put within you. I will remove the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and I will cause you. When my spirit lives inside of you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. When God's Spirit moves inside of me, I will keep and do God's will. Did you hear that? That's what that just said. When God puts His Spirit inside of me, when He gives me a new heart, I have to be, I have to do His will. Why? Because God said that's exactly what would happen. You will begin to obey me, is what that says. You will begin to hear my word, and you will begin to obey me. Listen to me very carefully, because this is important. You can't grow until this begins to happen in your life. Trust me. I'm just a messenger boy, but this is the truth. You cannot, cannot advance as a Christian unless you're obedient to God. 
Look at very important word. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and you will do them. You will keep and do. Keeping and doing is a result of the spiritual cleansing that God has done in your life. Look at John chapter 1 verse 12. Look at John 1 12. We're about to wrap up for the day. John chapter 1 verse 12. Jesus gives us another picture. It says John 1, 12. But as many as received Christ, but as many as received Christ, to them, to those people who received Christ, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. You see what that saying is? I was born not a son of God. When I was born in my first birth, I wasn't God's son. When I became a believer, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk more about that, what, what really happens there. Well, when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, when I became a Christian, when I believed Him, He adopted me into His family. I wasn't a son of God until that moment. And then I became a son of God. Now, the scriptures use the term adoption. It's a new life. He made me over. He recreated me. He didn't take just, he just gave me a whole new me. But they use the word adoption a lot. And I want you to understand, some of you are new and maybe have never heard this. A lot of you here have heard it before. But it's just, it's the way their culture worked. So when he was sharing this with the people, they got it. They understood what he meant. My children that were born to me. Adrian's sitting back there in the back. Uh, he is my natural born son. Now Adrian, I could get upset with Adrian as a natural born son. I could get upset with him. Never have. He's been perfect. But I could get upset with him. Not so with his sister Amanda. But with <laughs> I could get upset with Adrian and say to Adrian you're no longer my son. I am disowning you. And that was it. That's all I had to do. And in their culture, Adrian had no right to inherit anything that I had. Adrian couldn't call me dad. He could call me what he wanted, but it didn't mean anything. And the people in that culture who witnessed that said, Oh, well, Adrian's no longer your son. Doesn't matter what he does, doesn't matter how he acts, doesn't matter. He has disowned him, he is no longer his son. I could disown Adrian. However, if I had adopted Tony into the family, adopted Tony, he's not a natural born birth to me, he's adopted son. If I adopted in that culture, I could disown Adrian. I could never disown Tony once he was adopted into my family. Never. He would from. I could disown Adrian so that Adrian could not inherit anything that I have. I could never. Everything would pass from Adrian to Tony because he is my adopted son. He could never offend me to a point that I could get rid of him no matter what. No matter what he did to me as an adopted son, he had now full right to heirship to get anything and everything that there is. And so, Jesus Christ in the New Testament uses that over and over and over. And Jesus Christ came one day and he said to me, Ron, I'm going to adopt you into my family. And you know what that meant? Eternally, I could never be separated from God. I am his son, no matter how bad I am, I will be his son. No matter how good I am, I will be his son eternally forever I will never be disowned by God because of the rights of being adopted into his family and because of that it should motivate us to live a life of holiness when my father says to me Ron be ye holy Ron be ye holy because that is a trait of our family 
That's what our family does. Our family is holy. Be ye holy because I am holy. That is a part, just a very exact part of who my father is. I must represent my father everywhere I go in the same way. And so he says, God gave me the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born... Not of blood. Now get this. I was born not of blood. What that means is, I'm not a Christian, and I didn't become a Christian because my dad was a Christian. I didn't become a Christian because my grandfather was a Christian. It's not in our blood. Because my blood that I was born with was lost blood. I was not born. I didn't inherit my Christianity. So when a guy sits down next to you on an airplane and says, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian because my grandma. Mm -mm, no, you're not born of blood. Because your grandma's blood is inside of you, it doesn't make you a Christian. He says, you're not born of blood. You are not born of the will of the flesh. I can't make myself a Christian by my own will. I cannot in my own will. I can't go out and stop sinning on my own and hope to get to heaven. It's not going to happen. I can't clean up my life enough to get to heaven. I have this strong will that I can overrule my flesh and I can eat what I should. I can drink what I should. I can go where I should. And so if I just clean up my act, I can get to heaven. You cannot by the will of the flesh inherit eternal life is what he says nor by the will of man I can't will it for you if I can stand here this morning and say you're saved you're saved you're saved you're saved you're saved you're saved and I can do it if the will of man could save you you'd have all been saved by now my dear mother used to be in her bed and listen to her crying and calling out to God God save him God work in his life God change God, save him. God, work. Draw him to yourself. She, every day, every day, every day, every day, knelt by that bed, wept over her Bible, prayed for me, called my name out to God. My mother could not save me. It wasn't because if anybody had a will for someone to be saved, my mother had a will for me to be saved. And she pleaded with God to save me. You will not be saved by the will of somebody else. Can't happen. You know how it happens? The next word says this. Not from the will of man, but from the will of God. It's God. It's God who wills. It's God who works. It's God who draws. It's God who brings you to a place of salvation. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was raised from the dead. I was born again. I once was born. I was born the first time, and I was born the first time spiritually dead. And Jesus Christ gave me a new birth. And when the new birth came, there was so much that came with the new birth. But the new birth, and this is where we're going in this, the new birth must be fed. We talked about it just for a minute last week. I have a great grandson up in the balcony, or he was up in the balcony, he may be downstairs, he's downstairs now, he's in the back. He misbehaved in church. He's like his pap, great papa was. And so they had to take him back in the back, I guess. But Ezekiel Ray, if anybody could do anything right now for Ezekiel Ray to be saved, I would do it. Guarantee that. When Ezekiel Ray was born, he was born separated from God. Ezekiel Ray's got to make a decision someday. What he's going to do about Christ. Ezekiel Ray as a little baby requires feeding. Right? If you don't feed Ezekiel Ray, he won't live. Right? Reddington, you've been feeding him pretty regular, I expect, haven't you? Yeah. What is he, nine months old now? Eleven months old. So Reddington, how many times has he eaten in the last eleven months? Yeah, a lot, right? And so, and if you don't feed him, 
he tells you. He's hungry, right? He wants something to eat. And he's been that way since he was born. When you were born again, you had a hunger inside of you to know more about God. If you've been born again. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. Because your new birth is just like your old birth was. It's spiritual. And I've watched people who have either claimed to be born again who were not. Or people who are born again that have starved themselves to death spiritually. And there's nothing more disgusting when we have the ability to feed ourselves. I've told every one of you, if you need a Bible, I'll get you one. I'll get you one. I'll make sure that you can have the, what you need, your nourishment to grow. We have a meeting here three, four times a week at least. Four times every single week at least where we feed people. We feed them the truth and the scriptures. And then if you need it and you want it, we'll have another time that we'll sit down with you one-on-one -on -one to feed you. Because as a new, born-again baby in Christ, if you don't eat, you'll starve. And I look around at people who have made their way back out into the world, and they're no better than the heathens that they're living among. Don't you think, guys, it's time for us to make a name for Jesus Christ everywhere we go? And not a name for ourselves. That we stand up and make God proud, even if it destroys everybody else don't be ashamed of Christ he's giving you a new life a new opportunity a new birth something no one else can possibly do I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe right that's absolutely true what are you doing for Jesus first of all are you born again if you're not born again, you'll never grow. You'll never know. You can't. It's impossible. So if someone's not born, you can't educate them. Can't happen. But once they're born, we have the opportunity to begin right then teaching and training them to be what God created them to be. Father, I just pray, God, that you'll take the scriptures today and you'll speak to our hearts. If we're born again, then we need to be new creations. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It should be so radical. As a believer, it was to me. I didn't even understand it. But when you moved inside, and God, I am not an exception to the rule. I am not, and I know that. It is normal to be radically different. If any man's in Christ, if anyone and everyone that is in Christ is all that that means, they're a new creature. Old habits, old things, old life, old friends, old everything will soon be gone. Now there's a process that we learn as we're educated how all that happens. But God, it happens. It clearly happens. All things are gone and all things become new. Suddenly there's a new life. How could it be any different if the Spirit of God moves inside of us? How could it possibly be any different for me to sit and claim that, that I'm a Christian and still live in filth is absurdity. Even if I don't label it as that, it's absurdity. When God, all you say is, you said it to Nicodemus, you say it to us, you wrote it in Isaiah, you wrote it in Ezekiel, that if when a person is drawn out by God, their life will become so different that it is so obvious to themselves and to everyone else. We are now lights. We shine brightly everywhere we go. We are salt to a world that is in desperate need of healing. And God, for us to walk back out into the heathen and hide that, there's something seriously wrong with us. And yet, God, it's a pattern and a lifestyle that we are even seeing endorsed in churches. 
God, they're not even churches. I'm not being critical. I'm just being honest. We can't lead people to hide what you've done for them. Because that's not what you've called us to do. And so, God, I pray. I pray that you weigh on my heart and my life. And, Lord, I recommit myself to you today. Here am I. Send me. I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever you want. Lord, like we were talking about in Sunday school, this isn't my course to plan. This isn't my route. I'm perfectly happy to run the race that you've put in front of me. And God, I pray that that would be the case for every believer. And for those people today that are in this room, God, that have never been born again, may this be the day that they take steps to make sure that that takes place. In Jesus' name.